Welcome to Illinois in Focus. I'm Greg Bishop. Coming up, we'll review the week's top stories about the ongoing ComEd 4 trial in Chicago, action at the Illinois State House, and more. I'll then join the Center Square executive editor Dan McCaleb to further discuss the news. That's ahead with Illinois in Focus. I'm Greg Bishop. Hello, I'm Katherine Mincer, a family farmer raising corn and soybeans in Christian County, Illinois. It might be hard to believe, but 96% of the farms in Illinois are owned and operated by family farmers just like me. Our job is to grow the healthiest, most affordable food around to feed my family and yours. Meet more farmers just like me at www.watchusgrow.org slash corn. A message from the Illinois Corn Marketing Board. Welcome back to Illinois in Focus. I'm Greg Bishop. Here's some of the top stories from the past week. A close, longtime staffer for former Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan took the stand in the ComEd bribery trial Thursday, testifying under immunity about secretly recorded 2018 discussions about House leadership in which a longtime Madigan confidant participated. Will Cousinow, who served as the Speaker's Issues Director and as Political Director for the Democratic Party of Illinois, said he considered his rank in Madigan's world to be just below the likes of Madigan confidant Michael McLean, who's on trial. The testimony came during the federal trial of McLean and three other former political power players. And as that trial of the so-called ComEd 4 continues this week, more audio evidence being released by prosecutors. Last week, evidence released showed one of the former ComEd officials in the defendant in the ComEd 4 case, Mike McLean, he performed assignments from former Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan. My advice is that he pull the ads down. And number two, that is my request. Mm-hmm. And number three, John, you understand the position you've put me in, in terms of do I do something or do I do nothing? Monday, more tapes were released where McLean was telling lobbyists not to refer to Madigan directly. So if you just say our friend, no one really knows what we're talking about. So, Chicago Democratic State Representative LaShawn Ford said while he never felt intimidated by Madigan, he's glad he's not been asked to testify. He said the ComEd 4 trial is top of mind of all legislators at the Illinois State House. And it's uh, real life experience being played out to teach all of us a lesson. Republican State Representative Wayne Rosenthal, who's back in the legislature after eight years away, remembers Madigan having always had somebody do the messaging. He hopes the revelations from the released tapes from the criminal case bring changes to how the people's business is handled in Springfield. When people look at that and they know that that, that gets highlighted, then maybe it changes their way of doing business. And, you know, we won't know for sure for a while, but I think it's got the opportunity to do that. Madigan's not on trial until next year. The trial for the ComEd 4 continues next week. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party of Illinois is spending $300,000 on mailers and online campaigns for local school and library board races early next month. Democrats said in a news release they've identified dozens of candidates they recommend and oppose while launching a new website, DefendOurSchoolsIL.com. Last week, Governor J.B. Pritzker explained why his attention is on local school board races. He said billionaire Dick Uline is spending to put candidates in that are racist and anti-LGBTQ. And they want to take over school board so they can put their agenda forward uh, at our local schools and they shouldn't be elected and people who go to vote should know who these extremists are. There are lots of candidates who are running, Republicans or Democrats, they're not listed on the ballot as such. What we're trying to do is raise awareness about the extremists that are running. Shannon Adcock of Awake Illinois said that's a lie and grassroots candidates across the state are running on little funding. And I think he's very worried that everyday people with common sense and integrity are going to get elected to school boards. So, you know, when it comes to these smears and these these falsehoods about billionaires funding candidates, the only billionaire funding a candidate that I've seen is Governor Pritzker. So we have to right this ship and it will take Illinois voting for candidates with integrity who are focused on academics. Libraries in Illinois, including at K-12 through schools, could see their funding cut if there are efforts to restrict books under a bill that passed the House Wednesday. House Bill 2789 would limit federal pass-through tax dollars through the Illinois Secretary of State's Office for Libraries that remove or restrict books. During debate between Republican State Representative C.D. Davidsmeyer and bill sponsor, Democratic State Representative Ann Stava-Murray, the question of parental rights was raised. Could you ask that they not be taken to the library? 
if you're I don't that think, concerned. I don't think they should be completely kept from the library because there may be one or two books. I think they should be able to go to the library like every other kid. And you're not confident that your parenting has instilled in your children their own ability to choose their own books? I, I, I know for a fact, I know for a fact that my, my parenting will allow my children to, uh, to pick the right book. Republican State Representative Martin McLaughlin said the measure strong arms local communities and is a complete assault on local control. And for the state to tell a local library board, listen to the professionals, follow the professionals, I don't understand why we have local elections anymore if a bill like this passes. Stava Murray sponsored the bill and disparaged the opponents. Local control has long been a dog whistle for allowing statewide or nationwide racist or bigoted policies to persist. And by saying local control, you're booing and only one side is booing. I wonder why. Because maybe there's some truth to it. The measure passed the House 69 to 39 and can now be sent to the Illinois Senate. Those are the top stories from the past week from Illinois. Find more online at americastalking.com. Coming up for Illinois in Focus, I'll join the Center Square Executive Editor Dan McCaleb. This is Illinois in Focus, a production of America's Talking Network. I'm Greg Bishop. Freedom and liberty are important to all of us in Illinois, from Rockford to Carbondale, from Quincy to Decatur. If you're looking for civil, intellectual conversations with those shaping the future of freedom, try the Future of Freedom podcast with me, Scott Bertram. We speak with leaders across the country in the greater conservative and libertarian movements. In-depth conversations about where the next intellectual battles will happen across the country. It's the Future of Freedom podcast. Find it at americastalking.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Illinois in Focus. I am Dan McCaleb, executive editor of the Center Square Newswire service. Joining me today is Greg Bishop, the Center Square's Illinois associate editor and senior Springfield reporter. How are you doing today, Greg? It has been a busy drag out week, and my gosh, do we have tons to tackle everything from what's going on at the Illinois State House to what's going on at a federal courthouse up in Chicago. Uh, there's not a drought of any topics that's for sure no but you and your team have been on top of all of it as usual uh first we are recording this on thursday march 23rd why don't we get into what's going on at the federal courthouse in chicago um where the what's been dubbed the comed 4 trial is now in its uh second week uh former comed uh top executives and lobbyists uh, are facing trial on bribery conspiracy related um, charges. There have been lots of um, audio clips played of former House Speaker Michael Madigan, who was also charged in connection uh, with the, the ComEd trial, but he does not go on trial until next week. Let's make it clear. S- former Speaker next Madigan. Year. Next year. Sorry. Yes. Um, uh, former Speaker Madigan and the four on trial currently in Chicago have all pleaded not guilty. Um, one of the more interesting pieces of testimony this week, um, Greg, that at least in my mind, um, uh, was, that, uh, was that a, a former lawmaker, um, essentially said, uh, then Speaker Madigan controlled just about every aspect of a bill that benefited ComEd, $1.8 billion, a 2016 piece of legislation that essentially bailed out, uh, ComEd's nuclear power plants across the state. Tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah, so of course the uh, the trial really does hinge on this idea of a nearly decade long scheme between Madigan and his associates to curry favor through do little or uh, no work jobs uh, in exchange for favorable legislation for the utility. Uh, and uh, the the trial really started off with uh, you know of course jury selection, and then we started getting uh, some witnesses, and the witnesses that were lined up uh, range from uh, former state lawmakers like Lou Lang or Carol Sente uh, to even uh, uh, um, Scott um, 
Dreary, uh, who uh, was a, a Democrat at the state house, but uh, uh, jury didn't support Madigan, uh, and he was there to testify uh, in this case. Uh, but you also had uh, current state's representative Bob Rita there, uh, really laying out in, in a testimony that spanned over two days uh, to to talk about how Madigan's operation worked and how it's coordinated legislation, uh, and a lot of the testimony is still going on even today and. And uh, for the weeks ahead, uh, seems to be shifting away from the inner workings to how exactly this uh, alleged pay to play scheme played out uh, to get legislation favorable for the utility, uh, get all the votes lined up, get all the uh, the various uh, ins and outs lined up, and then to pass that at the Illinois State House uh, with uh, the pressure from uh, what federal prosecutors called Madigan Enterprise. So it's really been fascinating. A lot of documents, a lot of evidence that's being released. Uh, and we, of course, have been on top of all of that at the center square dot com. Yeah, so let's talk briefly about uh, uh, current state rep Bob Rita, who was who was a state rep um, uh, uh, when this 2016 legislation um, eventually passed, um, called the Future Energy Energy Jobs Act. Uh, Representative Rita uh, was the sponsor of the legislation, and he testified this this week that amendment was being made um, to the legislation that he had no idea about. Uh, but he testified that Michael McLean, one of the four defendants in this case and a very close confidant of former Speaker Madigan, came to him and, and essentially told him that Madigan wanted the wanted the amendment. So get it done. And Rita said he got it done. Um, so that was fascinating. Uh, more fascinating pieces of uh, evidence, even though Madigan himself is not on trial until next year. His voice has been heard quite a bit of times throughout uh, this trial. What what do you got for us there, Greg? I think my count is we've got uh, several dozen uh, audio clips that the federal prosecutors have released to the media that's being used as evidence. And these audio clips are wiretap recordings of phone calls. Uh, and uh, prominently featured is, of course, uh, Michael McLean and former Speaker Michael Madigan, uh, who Madigan was giving McLean assignments. And that's a, a word that even McLean used in multiple calls, uh, talking about the assignments he would be given by, quote, our friend. And he would tell other lobbyists that you don't work for a particular company. You don't work for your mom or dad. You work for Madigan, he would say. Uh, and one call here, and uh, we'll share a few clips with you. Uh, so in this clip, you have uh, Mike McLean calling a younger lobbyist on July 11th, 2018 to lay out his understanding of where his allegiance should lie uh, when it comes to dealing with, uh, with clients and uh, uh, who he needs to be beholden to. The assignment, that I carry the message, that's all. Yeah. No, I know. And then the picture really is, you know, once we should be building capital for the boss, not, not the other way around, so... Yeah. And uh, that's just one clip. And then you have multiple other clips that have McLean working a, quote, assignment for Madigan. And this circles around former state representative Lou Lang, who also testified during the trial this week uh, where Lou Lang, he was asked about the uh, cloud around him during the Me Too movement, why Lou Lang decided to step down from leadership. Uh, and uh, really, this this audio shows how McLean. McLean was acting as an agent for Madigan for Madigan's business to be done uh, without Madigan having any kind of association with it. Uh, here is uh, McLean talking to Lou Lang on behalf of Madigan with uh, Lang making it clear he hears who's really sending the message. And I guess this gal is claiming that she's not going public just unless you unless you're in leadership. Well, all right. So that's something I'll have to consider. But more important than what she has to say is what he has to say. And, right. Uh, I hear you. So, so Lang, uh, eventually after that call on November 8th, 2018, by the end of the year, he stepped down from leadership and went to what McLean called the dark side 
of lobbying. Uh, but there were even more audio clips that were released by federal prosecutors where Madigan's voice is heard contemplating what to do about a political riff between himself as House Speaker and the leader of the Democratic Party of Illinois and Illinois Senate President John Cullerton, whose members were growing more weary of being associated with Madigan. Here's Madigan talking with McLean in a wiretap recording uh, from September 5th of 2018 uh, in reference to what to do about the rift between him and Cullerton. Hi, Speaker. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you? Sorry about that stupid Cullerton move. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about. And he goes on to address uh, what exactly he should do and uh, have his agents work on behalf of Madigan to send a message to John Cullerton. Let me just share with you. My instinct is to call the guy and tell him, number one, I think what he's doing is inappropriate because we got plenty to work with with Trump. And rounder, and this is a general election, not a primary election. And, and, and my advice is that he pull the ads down. And number two, that is my request. Mm-hmm. So Madigan, he uh, again sharing uh, his thoughts that he wants his agent McLean to do in one of these assignments to eventually talk and send a message to Senate President John Cullerton at that time. And at the end of the call, I think it's interesting uh, that uh, McLean uh, really bolsters uh, Madigan's ego a bit and talking about uh, how he views Madigan uh, in these ongoing back and forth with uh, these assignments uh, and the, the messages that are being sent. Yeah. Well, you can put, I mean, uh, you know, you're a street fighter. I mean, I know you got a law degree, but you're more of a street fighter than anybody knows, except for maybe guys like me. Um, And if you want to put the squeeze on the guy, you could hurt him pretty badly. So, again, uh, Dan, I think that that shows you a bit and maybe what the prosecutors were trying to get across with all of this audio evidence uh, to highlight that uh, Madigan was using agents like McLean uh, to work assignments so that Madigan's name wasn't necessarily associated with the, quote, squeeze or the hammer being brought down on Lou Lang or elsewhere. So really fascinating evidence. Yeah, Lang, of course, uh, was being accused of um, sexual harassment, and, and that's why he was forced um, to resign. But I agree with you. Fascinating to get this inside look. You know, things that we may have suspected was going on behind the scenes for a long time, but now you've got actually the voices of the speaker, the voices of, of McLean and some of these lawmakers on tape. Um it would be nice to be in that courtroom to, to follow us. Of course, you and I have uh, our own jobs to do. We can't get there. So let me get, give credit to um, senior uh, Center Square reporter Brett Rowland and correspondent Glenn Minnis, who have been uh, inside the courtroom uh, between them gavel to gavel. Um, and, if, and we know from prosecutors, Greg, that this case could go on for another five or six weeks um, even You've been in the state house while this trial's been going on. You reported on, you know, whether lawmakers are paying attention to what's going on or not. Tell us about that. No, no question. They are paying attention. Talked with uh, Democratic State uh, Representative LaShawn Ford, uh, who said that uh, this is on uh, everybody's minds at the Illinois State House and really should be a lesson, he said, for uh, for future for future lawmakers and current lawmakers. Uh, but Ford also, when I asked if he was ever offered to testify in front of the uh, uh, federal prosecutors or in front of a jury, he said he's not been asked. He's thankful he's not been asked. And he also said he's never felt pressure from Madigan uh, to to vote a certain way. Uh, And Ford was also quick to say it's different under uh, House Speaker Emanuel Chris Welch. Uh, Ford said that Welch is very collaborative. He wants to hear from everybody, whereas Madigan seemed to be somewhat collaborative, however, would push certain agendas that Madigan felt that he wanted to uh, have have pass. Uh, But then you look on the other side and Republicans, uh, one that I talked with, Wayne Rosenthal, who was there at the Illinois State House eight years ago when Madigan was in office. Uh, he took eight years off, comes back, and and now he's back in the legislature. He talked about how Madigan always was very distant, and it seemed that there were always agents that were working on behalf of Madigan. So he wasn't surprised by some of the uh, revelations, uh, but uh, he does also hope that this brings about substantial change in how the people's business is done at the Illinois State House.
All right. Thank you for that uh, uh, report, Greg. But as the uh, and let me remind our listeners, you can get all of our trial coverage of the uh, Comet Four defendants on the ongoing uh, prosecutor's case at the centersquare dot com. We'll have daily coverage through the end of the trial. But Greg, simultaneously, as you said up front, lawmakers in Illinois are going about their business as well. So we have had extensive coverage of uh, what's been happening at the Illinois State House. One story you covered. Uh, this week has to do with controversial books that school libraries and other libraries um, have 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 um, gotten pushback from parents and others about. Um, uh, but the Illinois legislature um, essentially is moving forward a piece of legislation that would um, take potentially federal dollars away from libraries that do consider restricting or banning certain books. Yeah, so this uh, legislation was uh, brought forward uh, and really championed by uh, Secretary of State Alexei Janoulias in a way to uh, prohibit and work towards limiting the ability for libraries to uh, restrict what kinds of books are available, even libraries in public schools. Uh, And what this does is it would uh, limit the federal tax dollars that are passed through from federal taxpayers through the Secretary of State's office to libraries across the state through grants. And if a library does not follow the American Library Association's guidelines for their Bill of Rights when it comes to access to certain materials, then they could have that funding withheld. Uh, But there was a a lot of uh, uh, back and forth on the House floor on this bill where uh, some Republicans were pushing back, saying that uh, parents uh, need to be able to have better control over what's available at their school libraries, and even pushed back saying that this would strip local control from those locally elected library boards and school boards. Uh, but uh, the Democratic sponsor uh, seemed to indicate that uh, the, the, the pushback of uh, local control, uh, she called it a dog whistle. State Representative Ann Stava Murray uh, said that local control has been used in the past for bigoted purposes. Uh, that, of course, drew a lot of boos from Republicans in the House whenever this uh, bill ultimately did pass. Now it's up to the Illinois Senate if they want to pass it. And this is interestingly timed because we do have uh, local school board and library board races along with city races uh, coming up with elections April 4th. Uh, So the legislature is definitely um, uh, queuing things up uh, and uh, getting those uh, those conversations and those talking points out there through passing legislation. And just to provide a little bit of context, um, separately, uh, the Center Square uh, 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 managing editor, Tom Gannert, filed a bunch of um, Freedom of Information Act requests with schools, uh, K through 12 schools across the country to see what kind of books they were buying for their libraries. And uh, across the board, we saw books like controversial books like Gender Queer, which provides very graphic um, uh, sexual uh, activity details in both words and in pictures, um, books like that and uh, books uh, that advance uh, critical race theory um, philosophies and stuff like that. So these are the books that, that we're talking about that um, um, that some parents have uh, ha- have waged protests over. I don't think the debate is anywhere um, uh, far from over because this measure has to come back up in the Senate, not just on the Senate floor, but also in Senate committees. And uh, we're going to see all this come together in short order. Right. We'll look forward to your uh, continued reporting on that topic at thecentersquare.com. We have just a little bit of time left to talk. I want to talk about one last um, story. Um, Happy anniversary, uh, by the way. Um, it, It was three years ago this week that uh, Governor Pritzker put in place his stay at home and other COVID-9 uh, restrictions, put them in place. Um, we're still, we're now three years on. Illinois is still under a disaster proclamation, although that's supposed to be ending in May after the COVID took over Illinois and the world. But again, as usual, Greg, thank you for you, your insight into these very important stories. Um, reminder to listeners, you can uh, stay up with Greg's reporting and all of the Center Square's reporting at thecentersquare.com. For Greg Bishop, I'm Dan McCaleb. Please subscribe and thank you for listening. 